So um, I'm going to talk about avionics systems and really two topics, complexity and cost. Um, it turns out that there are about a half million pilots in the U.S. A little less than half of them are private pilots. And what I want to do is to start by talking about the difference between the professional pilots and the private pilots. And if you start to look at how frequently they fly, it really becomes apparent. So on professional pilots, if you take the 90th percentile of professional pilots, they tend to fly between 150 and 250 flights per year. The average is 220. And so they're flying four or five times a week. A general aviation pilot, on average, the 90th percentile, they fly between 25 and 50 times per year, with the average at about 35. So they're flying maybe twice a month. It's this disparity in the frequency of how often they're in the cockpit that changes the need for a different level of complexity in the avionics. So similarly, if you look at how many flight hours are logged per year, you can see that the professional pilots, you know, somewhere between 500 and 800 hours per year. General aviation pilots, much less. The 90th percentile is 200 down to about 50, and it's heavily weighted at the bottom of that, with the average being about 70. Keeping that in mind, and the fact that GA pilots tend to be flying less every year. Just in the past decade, the average number of hours flown per pilot per year is down about 15%. So when you think about that, and then you add on top of that the fact that in general aviation, we've had a lot of neat technology that's kind of entered our market over the last 15 or 20 years. It started with um, a GPS and uh, moving maps, and these allowed people, I, I know that when I began flying, it was in a standard six-pack airplane, and the biggest challenge was figuring out where I was and where I was going. Moving maps and GPS, it, it kind of solves all that. I know that I was particularly excited the first time I flew an airplane that had DME. I thought, well, this is great. I know how far away from Pueblo Airport I am, and, and that was uh, thrilling. Well, now, you know, this is a tremendous step forward. Electronic flight bags, you don't have to carry all the maps, glass cockpits, uh, satellite and uh, weather and terrain, a big deal. Envelope protection in some of the more current autopilot systems, it's been a, a big step forward. And now with ADSB coming, soon we're going to have free weather and, and free traffic. So that's going to be another big step forward. But with this came an increase in complexity. So if we think about that old six-pack that many of us learned on, and you make a shift over to a glass panel, you've got to learn a lot more procedures and steps in order to utilize that technology. Now, recently, there's been a move to try to take some of the complexity out. And I think a lot of the iPad apps are focusing on this. I know that ours that was just released last week, My Wingman, we went to special lengths to make sure it was intuitive and easy to use. But for the most part, the panel-mounted systems, the glass panel systems, are, are fairly complex. Avidyne is the brand of choice for pilots who want innovative, easy-to-use avionics. And the new IFD 540 and 440 FMS GPS Navcoms set a new standard for ease of use and simplicity. As plug-and-play replacements for legacy 530 and 430 series navigators, the HyperTouch user interface of the IFD 540 and IFD 440 makes it much easier to access the information you want while reducing head down time and making flying more enjoyable. Now you have a choice, and the choice is easy, Avidyne. Now when we think about complexity, you can really break it down into two categories. One of them is accessing the information you need, and we call this directions to the machine, so it goes from the man to the machine. The other kind is understanding, and that's what is the machine telling the human? And is it easy to understand? And so in thinking about complexity in those two ways, that is the challenge for uh, avionics manufacturers. So the conclusion that we draw is that because of the lack of frequency of use by GA pilots, the avionics systems of today are just simply too complex for most pilots. Okay, so let's switch over to cost now. Um, back in 1968, 
we estimate that the cost of avionics in a brand new 172 was about $2,000. And it might actually be a little bit less than that. If you fast forward today, it's probably 20 to 25 times that much. And granted, the cockpits look different, there's more functionality, but even if you take out the effect of inflation, this is still a tremendous increase in cost. And we feel like it's contributing to the increased cost of flying. Another way to look at cost is to look at the pilots that use it. And so if you take a, a roughly 300,000 GA airplanes in the world, most of them are in North America, about two-thirds. And in fact, over half of them are in the US. So when we look at data about general aviation pilots in the US, we're representing most of the marketplace. And it turns out their average age is about 49 years old. And you can see a big demographic bulge in the late 40s and through the 50s. And then on the income side, similarly, you see a big hump right here and going on out. So that it turns out that a lot of the people that fly are older and well off. And so one of the things you kind of, kind of wonder is, if flying was less expensive, would you get more people participating in these income ranges? And as a result, would you end up having more people participate in these age ranges? Would it, would it kind of level out this demographic bulge? And, and we think it would. This is a, another format of a graph that we saw earlier, but if you look at airplane production, the history of airplane production over the last 60 years, the bulk of them were built between 1960 and 1980. That was really the payday, and in that 20-year span, the OEMs averaged 12,000 airplanes a year. Compare that to last year where about 1,200 airplanes were built. And so that the average age of, the, of general aviation airplanes, we calculate, is about 34 years. Because so many of these airplanes are older, if you look at current hull values, the market value of the airplanes, more than a third of them are worth less than $50,000. And two-thirds of them are less than $100,000. So when you think about 200,000 airplanes out there that have a hull value of less than $100,000, are they going to spend 60 or 40 or even $20,000 to upgrade their avionics? And our feeling is no, they're not. So it, we've really got to come up with a lower cost solution if we want them to do that. And so for the most part, the, the modern avionics systems are just, they're simply too expensive. Welcome to the Aero News Network, the aviation world's most comprehensive news and information resource. Real-time, 24-7 online, audio, and video programming, where aviation has been getting updated for over a decade. Distributing over 11,000 stories, features, audio, and video programs every year. Only ANN covers aviation and aerospace with this much depth, insight, and expertise. Check us out on the web at aero-news.net. Here's some uh, uh, data on accidents, and this is in a rate per 100,000 hours flown. And so, of just accidents in total, that you can see that it's been fairly flat at about six and a half accidents per 100,000 hours flown. And then the fatals are down a little over one. But the key here is that there's been no change in the trend. And I think we all realize this, it, it's been flat. And this, in spite of the fact that we have all these new technologies in the cockpit, when we think about accidents that occur, this was up earlier, loss of control is a significant one, and we believe that most of this occurs in the airport environment. So what we did was we took the number of accidents that we believe happened in each one of these phases in flight, and we overlaid it on the workload. And so not surprisingly, we see a lot of the accidents occur when the workload is high, and unfortunately, you're close to the ground. To us, this says, hey, there's even more reason to make sure that avionics manufacturers do not contribute to the problem, that, that we don't raise this workload at all. If anything, we should find ways to bring it down. So these are the conclusions that we draw from this data that we looked at, and it's going to help kind of shape our strategy for Bendix King in the future. So first of all, technology is making a lot of very important information available to pilots in the cockpit. ADSB is going to be a big thing. The free weather and traffic is going to be a great step forward for people. 
With infrequent flights and low annual flight hours, it's going to be tough for GA pilots to make a lot of complex procedures to use their avionics to make that second nature. That's going to be a very tough putt. And so it's up to the avionics manufacturers to make it so they don't have to be so up to speed and, and have practice it four times a week in their flying careers. They need to be able to activate their avionics systems and obtain the information they need in an intuitive manner, something that, that is easy to remember. And it's got to be done at a cost that is affordable for even people that are flying $30,000 airplanes, $40,000 airplanes, $60,000 airplanes. And so it's got to be, from a financial perspective, it's got to be accessible. And then finally, we really do think that avionics can make a difference in uh, GA safety. And um, I actually plagiarized this a little bit. About a year ago, I sat down with uh, Alan Klapmeyer, and we were talking about avionics systems. And he said, whatever you do, make it really, really easy to use. And you know, I think he, was, he hit it right on the head. That's exactly what we need to do.